Hi there, my name is Philip Heidson. I want to welcome you to the Art of Procurement podcast, the podcast that helps you, a forward-thinking procurement professional, position yourself and your team to proactively take advantage of the revolution that's taking place in procurement today. By interviewing industry trailblazers and sharing insights from our own experiences, my team and I pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that procurement teams are using to elevate their impact. Experiential procurement is a topic we're going to be discussing in detail throughout 2022. We featured it as one of the three core foundations of the new procurement in our recent start of the year letter. And in short, the experience that we provide as procurement to all stakeholders in both interacting with us and in navigating the buying process is fundamental to the impact that we can have and subsequently the role that we play in our businesses. And so today on the podcast, I'm joined by Tim Jones to go a little bit deeper into this topic. Tim was a past guest of Atta Procurement right at the very beginning. And as we discussed in the pod, it's our highest ever listened to episodes. It's taken a few years for the stars to align and for Tim to be able to join us back on the pod, but I'm delighted to be able to welcome him today. So without further ado, let's roll the tape. So I was looking back in the uh, uh, the history, Tim, and it was seven years ago since we last spoke, which is kind of crazy. Wow. Uh, all the way back in episode 14 or 16 or something like that. And it's been a long time favorite, I think, of uh, certainly of me and, and definitely of AOP listeners. So delighted to welcome you back onto the show. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'm always uh, surprised how many people I uh, I meet who who reference back that podcast. <laughs> I always say if I'd have uh, realised um, what an audience it would get, I would have paid a bit more attention <laughs> to what I was saying. Uh, but uh, it seems to have gone down pretty well. Yeah, it's you know one of those things. I think in those early days we had like maybe it was my my mum and my dogs and you know a few other people who would listen. So um, that one definitely had some longevity because I know people are still listening to it seven years later. Great stuff. Um, well, a lot's happened in the last seven years. I wonder if you could just kind of share how your career journey has progressed since uh, that first conversation we had on the podcast. Yeah. So um, back in uh, 2015, I was uh, head of the strategic sourcing team at, at Google and uh, Carried on in in that role for another uh, five years or so, and mm-hmm. you know went through some tremendous uh, continued growth uh, at Google over the you know ten years or so I was there. It grew ten times, whether that's in terms of uh, company revenue or supplier spend or team size or all of that sort of stuff. So um, then about a year ago, I uh, finally left uh, Google. I wasn't sure I'd ever pull the plug, but I did and uh, went to Epic Games. Uh, some of you may know uh, them or, or your kids may know them from, from Fortnite. Yeah. I, uh, I get constant uh, pushing from my son to uh, download it, I think, uh, nearly every day <laughs> at the moment. Awesome. <laughs> um, and so uh, I was vice president uh business operations and procurement there and spent a year, uh, amongst other things, setting up the procurement team, uh, but uh, running the real estate and security and admin teams uh, and just finishing up there and uh, about to start my next opportunity. You know, you've worked with Google and Epic and companies. You talked about the growth at Google. Um, do you see the role of procurement differently to support a growth organization and a fast growth organization? Uh, than perhaps, you know, the more traditional. And I know before you were um, at Google, I seem to remember you were at BA at British Airways, you know, more traditional industries. Um, I think at heart, uh, we're trying to do the same thing, right? We're trying Mm. to uh, uh, find suppliers that fit the needs of the organization um, uh, and deliver uh, value for the company. Uh, Perhaps some of the attributes that uh, are important in that best fit are different. Uh, and certainly uh, at Google and Epic, Google and Epic, it, uh, uh, you know, scaling, suppliers that could scale to fit the growth uh, was super important. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps more important than, uh, you know, traditional kind of cost saving measures that were, were very uh, top of mind at, at British Airways. 
So when, you know, we've obviously over the last seven years, we've kept in touch and um, we uh, at at Procurement wrote a post at the end of the year. We always look back with a kind of year end post and we call it day one for procurement, Um, you know, which is always kind of that mindset of we can always, one, we're in control of our own destiny. Um, and you know, we're not always looking at and complaining about why we're not able to do things. Uh, it's in a kind of in our own hands, uh, but always we can look forward and do new things and try new things. And, uh, we talked about a few different themes related to procurement that we saw this year and you reached out after that. I just wonder if you could share a little bit of kind of what piqued your interest as we talked about this idea of day one for procurement. Yeah, I love that model. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, one of the things that you talked about was experiential procurement, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, what what experience are we creating for the people around us? Uh, and I think you know that's that's absolutely central to how we should think of ourselves and our, and our role in the companies. Yeah, we looked at um, kind of three different. Uh, themes for procurement one was all about driving outcomes being focused on outcomes um uh, another one was really coming to the table with insights but yeah that third one which i think is to be so pivotal to everything we do is around the experience and, and i think one of the things that we as a profession haven't necessarily focused on so much um maybe we've had to focus on it in an organization where we're smaller um you know, where you don't have the leverage, but in some of the larger organizations, certainly it's not been as big a focus. You know, you could talk about customer of choice and it's sometimes looked at as being, ah, you know, that's not really important. Um, you know, what's your experience? I, I use that unintendedly kind of with ex- <laughs> experiential um, um, procurement and people's experience of that. Like, is it something that you've seen be important? Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me, you know, thinking about the experiences that we create is about, you know, mindset mm-hmm. um, and about thinking from the outside in and just designing, you know, processes and interactions that uh, are fit for purpose for the people uh, trying to use them. You know, the trap that I've seen as I, you know, talk to other procurement uh, professionals or, you know, I've even seen creeping into uh companies that uh, that I've worked in is that we get tangled up in in being inwardly focused and become obsessed by you know how the procurement sausage is made yeah. whether that's you know uh, what the savings calculation calculation methodology is or you know what templates we're using or stage gates or compliance metrics or all this kind of stuff um when what we should be obsessed with is the experiences that we're creating for for stakeholders suppliers and and uh, perhaps more importantly than ever you know our team members Mm -hmm. yeah it's funny all those things that we see as important um nobody really cares outside of procurement do they we hold them to be uh, you know important things that we should um consider when we're building process or You know, when we're looking at technology, when we're analyzing what technology to buy, um, but at the end of the day, like you said, they don't really care how the sausage is made. They just care what the benefit and the impact is that you're able to bring them. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, one of the most dangerous uh, phrases in the procurement dictionary, I think, is is maverick spend. Mm -hmm. You know, it implies that there are you know people out there who are ignoring us or somehow you know doing the wrong thing when in reality, that they were just a bunch of users who, you know, we've often let down, uh, and who are, you know, so exhausted by the bureaucracy that we've created around them that they just found a better way to, you know, get their business done. Yeah, yeah, that we're just not providing a compelling enough reason for them to want to use us to help them get what they need. Yeah, just not adding enough value. Right. So as we think about. The notion of experiential procurement, you know, and take a step back into looking at across the procurement process. Um, I think the area where people think about the experience most often is the the REC or the PO approval process. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you kind of think about the exper- the procurement experience when folks are going through that process. Yeah. So, you know, I'm <laughs> old enough that uh, when I started out in my uh, procurement career, 
um, you know, users weren't yes used to, you know, e-commerce and would put up with complex buying processes and, uh, you know, processes that weren't necessarily intuitive or, you know, we used to uh, build in time for a training course on how to use the buying system. But, you know, modern e-commerce and, you know, I guess Amazon in particular has, uh, has ruined that for everyone, you know, and, and users now have absolutely no tolerance for procurement systems that, you know, aren't completely intuitive, uh, aren't jargon free, that, you know, uh, aren't easy to navigate. And, um, you know, while users have no tolerance for those things, you know, we've yet to see really some of the big uh, procurement software uh, vendors adapt to that. Um, yeah, you know, uh, at Epic, uh, you know, we were so frustrated really with the user journey that, that, that people had to go through that we ended up uh, building an extension out to Slack. Right. So that uh, spend approvers could see the data they needed within their Slack feed and be able to approve requisitions uh, more easily rather than, you know, having to click through multiple screens uh, to be able to find, uh, you know, an approve or reject button. Why do you think that is that some of the software providers haven't adapted? Is it they've not needed to? Is it just, you know, the pace of change is is probably slower than we want and they just haven't caught up in some respects? Like, I think, I think some of it is, um, you know, trying to build comprehensive end-to-end solutions that, fit every eventuality mm-hmm. and end up not being great for anybody, you know, and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm excited by the rise of some of the sort of point solutions in, yeah. in procurement that can, uh, do some of these tasks individually, uh, that much better. Now we've talked on the show. Um, I, I'm remembering a conversation I had with Dr. Eloise Epstein talking about the idea of um, app ecosystems. You know, perhaps you yeah. have a couple of core platforms, but you're building an ecosystem using apps around it. And I just wonder where you, as a as somebody who, you know, is looked at architecting a procurement uh, tech capability, and no doubt will be doing in the future. You know, how do you think about that? Yeah, no, I love that concept. I think uh, I think it'll be the future. You know that uh, when we you know want spend analysis, we'll go to our spend analysis app. We want to uh, approve a purchase order, we'll go into our purchase order approval or, uh, app. Um, and we'll, you know, it's just a great way of getting individual tasks done in a uh, smooth way. And this rec to PO process, I talk a lot about it as being. It's sometimes something that, and I speak from experience, you know, of going into transformations too, you look at it at the beginning and think, you know, do I really want to get involved in POs, uh, PRs to POs and invoicing um, payments when, you know, the interesting stuff is doing some category management and, um, you know, working on strategy and saving a bunch of money. But the reality is that, at least in my experience, like 80% of the perception of procurement is driven by someone's user experience of buying the stuff they need every day. And if you don't get that right, you're never really going to get the chance to work on what we may consider as being the more interesting stuff. And I use kind of air quotes around that. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think um, there's the PO uh, approval process, but I think another sort of great bellwether is the supplier setup process. Mm-hmm. You know, and um it's a great indicator of whether a procurement team is is inward focused or uh, stakeholder focused. You know, if it takes more than a day or two to set up a, a new supplier, then you know, then something's wrong. How much should we? And maybe this is a loaded question, but how much should we care about the supplier experience? Yeah, I think it's um, it's absolutely crucial. You know, with the the, the success of our organisations is about building an ecosystem um, you know, where we, we match the capabilities of our own organization with, with that of an ecosystem of suppliers. Uh, and we're only going to get the, the best relationships um, if we think carefully about you know, the experiences of a supplier. Yeah, how, because I think about um, 
your experiences with Google, you know, and I've worked in some big companies and oftentimes it's the bigger companies that focus less on that because they think we've got the scale and the leverage. Um, and, you know, that's probably more in the manufacturing um, environment that I have that experience. But, you know, when you're in, when you've worked in large companies, have you seen that? It's really easy for this sort of buyer arrogance to yeah. slip in. Uh, and this mindset of, you know, we're the customer and the supplier just needs to jump through the hoops uh, and do what it takes. Um, you know, paying suppliers on time and, and giving them easy transparency to their invoice status. I think, you know, I think that's table stakes. Yeah. Um, and what we, we really need to focus on is, you know, the uh, supply selection process and the supply management process. You know, if you think about, um, you know, this buyer arrogance creeping into RFPs, you know, I always like to make sure that we're just saying, you know, pleases and thank yous and, and writing our RFPs in a sort of welcoming tone of, of uh, you know, showing that we're, we're looking out to set up a partnership here. Um, you know, just some little things that, you know, we should make sure that we're giving suppliers an adequate time to, Give a give a reasonable response to right. to an RFP, and we're not asking a bunch of extraneous questions. Yeah. You know? Unnecessary uh, RFP questions are a big pet hate of mine. Um, you know the RFPs with you know hundred questions uh, are just making suppliers jump through hoops. They're discouraging great suppliers from going through the effort of responding. Mm -hmm. And then of course on the procurement side, we've got to read all those responses. Uh, and grade them, and it's just a you know a waste of everybody's time. You know, at, at Google, I had a, a challenge to the team that could you write an RFP that just had ten questions in, and uh, you know we didn't always necessarily get there, but it set this mindset of of uh, you know is every question absolutely yeah. necessary, and and what's the response I'm going to get back, and and how useful is it to uh, to making the supply selection. Yeah, what's the most important information I need to be able to make a decision as opposed to thinking well, that you're under some kind of scrutiny if you miss something because you didn't ask 100 questions? Yeah, this desire for com full completeness is the is the kind of rookie mistake there. You know, I think our role in procurement and strategic sourcing in particular is to, you know, distill complex decisions right down to their essence. Uh, and this gets into, you know, the stakeholder experience that, you know, that as we're creating interactions with our stakeholders, we should be making it easier and quicker for them to sort through mm -hmm. complex decisions and, and make the right decision quickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, creating uh, long, boring <laughs> RFP response documents for them to read or complicated uh Supply selection matrices yeah. is is uh, is not a great experience. Yeah, that's a great point. I actually just want to call up when you're talking about the RFPs and using you know friendly language in there. There's, again, just a small thing, but I always like to do is just continue to thank participants in RFP processes, whether it's in calls, meetings, whatever it is with them, just for the investment that they make in being a part of it and acknowledging that. You know that it it can be so expensive to respond to an RFP, the resources that you put in there. Um, and sometimes we create these boundaries, like these walls, these communication walls, um, where it seems like it's just a one way process uh, and just things like that make a difference, I think, because they realize that, you know, whatever the outcome you appreciate and you've acknowledged the fact that, you know, that they've had to invest in you, um, and yeah, you know, I, I love motivate it. Yeah. them to do that. I think it. Just, you know, just two things for me. One, you know, thanks participant, but it's also a reminder, a reminder for me here that, you know, not to have that buyer arrogance mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and be, be humble and, um, you know, value the, the input that we're getting from, from each and every uh, supplier. Now, how about the supplier onboarding process? Um, you know, you talked a little bit about giving them transparency around invoicing and uh, that being table stakes. And as somebody now on the other side of the table who gets mostly paid late, uh, I, I completely uh, agree with that sentiment. Um, and I know as a buyer, I would always look at it thinking again, well, this is a nuisance. You know, I'm just going to push this to AP uh, and not really, you know, you didn't see the impact that that has on the businesses that you work with. Um, 
but that onboarding process is another one, you know, where you basically asking them to sign in to use new technologies or answer a bunch of questions or fill in forms three times or use a tool, which is really hard. Um, and perhaps we don't put enough effort in, into considering that when we're looking at technology solutions, for example. Yeah, completely. I mean, I think it, it lets everybody down, doesn't it? it the, the, uh, you've gone through, a, a, perhaps you've gone through a complicated RFP process. You've done a great job of you know, helping your stakeholder make a decision. Uh, and then you get stuck for, for weeks yep. just doing the last little bit of the, of the process because you know, not enough time and thought and resources have gone into that last step. And, um, you know, it's, it's even more frustrating, um, perhaps when you just try to make a quick decision and get something done quickly. Um, you know, supplies selection has been made quickly. Um, business is, is eager to get on, on with it. The supplier is eager to get on with it, but you know, you've got to go through these hoops, um, and, uh, you know, the, it's perhaps part of the organization that's you know, least resourced poorly, that hasn't had the investment in automation um, and has got, you know, extra unnecessary steps in. And we just need to strip all that out and look at it from the from the user perspective. Now, one of the things that you referenced um, about strategic sourcing and, um, you know, as we go through that RFP process, for example, asking for too many questions and, um um, and getting a lot of information we don't even do anything with. And, and one of the things, and I think this relates to sourcing, but it could, it also kind of ties in with the re- whole requisition and PR process too, is, you know, the, the conversation around um, self-service sourcing and devolving, because we've always had this push, we've got to bring, spend on the management, we've got to bring stuff into the procurement's purview so that we feel like we're having an impact because of some arbitrary spend on the management number, which, you know, everybody kind of calculates differently based on, um, how uh, mature their organization is. Um, you know, when we think about experiential procurement, is devolving the ability to buy back into the business part of that for the vast majority of things that they want to buy? So I think the important point there is about having a really good triage process for deciding where am I going to put my effort mm-hmm. and where am I going to... Um, you know, focus on on speed, and you know, maybe devolve uh, decision making completely to to the stakeholder. Um, you know, if you can get that triage uh, decision point right, then you know you're investing your time and resources in the in the decisions that that really require it, and getting out of the way of others where the business just needs to move quickly. If you get it wrong, then you know, you're either slowing down the works and, and adding unnecessary steps um, into decision, straightforward decisions that don't need it. Yeah. Um, or or you're, if you're going wrong the other way, you're um, not getting involved in, you know, important decisions and, you know, they're being made without a... Uh, uh, full information and without proper due diligence and you know you make the wrong decision or put uh, put in the wrong solution or business model or pricing mechanism and you get a suboptimal business result now from an experience perspective how important do you think is tech in enabling that kind of uh, even if it's i mean technology can enable the triage to some extent but then what you do once you've triaged it you know where you've sent them whether it's to a um you know an amazon like buying experience depending on what it is they want to buy or even through one of these um you know one of the more traditional um well not traditional i guess they're they're more emerging but the guided buying platforms that can go beyond you know the the buying the nuts and the bolts and the commodities and help folks self-buy services for example yeah the technology is good but but it's only as good as the rules that you Mm -hmm. set for it right and so you know what are what are the criteria and by which you know, you decide you're going to get involved or not, uh, and being really uh, thoughtful about that, and uh, also realistic about um, you know the capacity you've got to be able to serve that need. Right. Yeah. You know, it's all very well saying you know I want to be involved in you know 
anything over half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you haven't got the resources for that, you're just going to create a, you know, a really crappy experience for everybody. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some of those, um, boundaries need to be fuzzy. So <laughs> that when you've got bandwidth, you yeah. can go deeper in, in, uh, in a broader range of projects. And then, you know, other times you're going to, uh, let some things go and uh, focus on speed uh, for them. That, does it make sense for us to, you know, for those, uh, so you go through the triage process and, you know, the responsibility kind of lies back with the, uh, the stakeholder to go through the process to provide them with tools, guidance, templates, you know, some way of them being able to do it and not feeling like they're on their own, but without it meaning that, you've still got to have them consult with somebody and it's kind of defeating the purpose, you know, from a time perspective, you know, can we set them up with some rules or some tips or just other ways that they can go and make that purchase in the way that's most effective? Yeah. You know, I think it's about being deliberate about the different, you know, buying channels that people have open to them. And, you know, at, at some level, that's going to be a bunch of catalogs. At mm -hmm. some point it might be, you know, some templates, uh, sometimes it might be, you know, uh, a outsourced, um, you know, low, low input, fast, you know, three bids in a buy type yeah. service. And then, uh, you know, other times it's going to be full deep dive, uh, you know, seven steps procurement process. Now, the one area that we haven't touched on yet about experience, because we've looked mostly outward, you know, looked at suppliers, we've looked at stakeholders, um, is our own internal employees. And, um, you know, we're often the ones that are, are left holding the bag, so to speak, on managing some of these processes. Um, so how can we be thinking about our own, like the procurement employees when it comes to process and the experience that they have in, in doing the delivery work when we're kind of architecting uh, what the procurement process looks like? Yeah, I think, you know, with the, the great resignation, the rubber hitting the road here. Uh, and as procurement leaders, it's even more important for us to be finding, you know, providing a inspiring experience for, for procurement team members. Yeah, and for me, that's about making sure as most of the, you know, daily workload is meaningful work that that people can see how it moves the needle for the business. From a personal perspective, I, I think this is true for a lot of people, but, you know, there's nothing more soul destroying than, I don't know, arguing about how to calculate savings after yeah. a after a deal that I know is a good deal, but you know the, the uh, you know mm -hmm. there's a fight about how to justify it, mm -hmm. or, or yeah, you know, spending hours updating endless um, status uh, spreadsheets. You know, it's just uh, it creates a horrible working. Uh, uh experience for the team members and it's you know it's it's lazy management really it's um it's born out of uh a fear i think amongst leaders that uh unless we create you know rigid guidelines for our, our team members they're not going to do the right thing mm -hmm. uh and, but uh i would much rather you know, team members working for me are spending the vast majority of their time talking to stakeholders, building supplier strategies, negotiating with suppliers, or uh, you know, designing great processes, or you know, automating uh, bits of the procurement process that are broken. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the more time people can spend doing that, and and the less time on inward looking sausage making yeah. activities the better yeah and i think the the second piece there is about career paths yeah and and if we want to get the best out of people we need them to feel confident that if they consistently perform well and they're curious and willing to you know invest in in learning new things then you know we provide a career path for them to grow you know their career and and grow as people you know, 
one of the things that that I thought of as you were talking about, you know, the impact on our um, our internal employees within procurement is this idea of empowering them to, with flexibility, you know, because that ties in with with stakeholder experience. Oftentimes, pushing pushing stakeholders through a, a a process that may exist but we know isn't necessarily fit for purpose, or there's nuances around whatever the the category is or the sourcing project, and you get forced through this process. There's, there's hardly anything that leads to a dissatisfied customer uh, than doing that. Um, but yet we need to you know have some kind of process. Uh, in place um, because you know that drives consistency and helps us scale as well. So, where do you kind of land on giving flexibility to your employees around the process so that they're not always just trying to fit you know round pegs into square holes? Oh, I think it's absolutely absolutely essential that you know we tailor any process that we have to you know one the project that we have in front of us. And two, the needs of the stakeholder. Mm-hmm. You know, the stakeholder, um, each stakeholder is an individual who's going to have a different set of needs. You know, some may know the supply market backwards. Yeah. And, you know, us investing time in doing a market review uh, because that's the next step of our process is a complete waste of time because the stakeholder completely knows it. In, in other circumstances, the opposite is true. Yeah. And, um, you know, the most value we can add in other circumstances is to bring the stakeholder, you know, new, new suppliers that they don't know about, uh, new innovations that they haven't heard of. Uh, and that's just one example. Um, yeah, I think there needs to be some kind of consistent branding mm-hmm. that if a stakeholder is working with, Two different team members that they get, they feel like they're getting a, a similar experience. Um, but we need to empower people to uh, be completely flexible on the uh, steps that they take. You know, I want to jump on that what you said about consistent branding. That's been one of my, um, I don't know if pet peeves is the right way of of saying it, or maybe just something that I've gone into every organization with as kind of my initial focus is that, you know, having folks know what it's like to, what it means to interact with procurement and having an expectation of what they're going to get in return and what things look like and, you know, down to what branding you use and what the PowerPoint presentation is going to look like and all those kind of things. I know it's with my marketing hat on, but I think that that's really, really, really important because otherwise you just look like you're really disjointed. Um, And it's really hard to replicate, you know, good practices um when you're not doing it so sometimes yeah, people, people look yeah, at me yeah. and say like oh you know i think there's a balance there though yeah. where, so, you know i think making us look as if we're on one team is one thing mm-hmm. but but saying hey there's only one template that we use for this um yeah yeah and, and again yeah when you when you fall into that that kind of mindset then uh again you you get to fitting uh, square holes in square pegs in round holes yeah. and then uh, I, guess, I guess for me it's it's the look and the feel more than the um yeah you know the documents if you know what i mean it's all yeah, the language that we use yeah. or, but I, you know again i we could got to treat that with some balance mm-hmm. you know the the language is in the sort of terminology is important the you know when i use a phrase um you know everyone on the team knows what i mean by it it doesn't have their own interpretation i think that's important but then you know having a um uh a language police where right. you know a particular phrase is banned or, mm-hmm. or whatever i think is uh is not a, a great employee experience so i i worked with a client one time that um had banned the word rfp Right. So, um, and you know, our job with this client was to go in and run a bunch of RFPs. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to, you know, think creatively about how we could put term and position this without yeah. anyone thinking it was a true RFP. There you go. <laughs> um, well, Tim, I want to thank you so much for your time today and for uh, jumping back on the show uh, all these years later. Um, you know, it's. I think ex- I'm encouraged that we're talking more as a profession about the experience that folks have in interacting with us. 
perhaps uh, a recognition of its importance. Um, so um, I do I do think it's really key for us to think about in all the different dimensions that we talked through today. Love it. I really enjoyed uh, speaking to you, Phil, uh, as ever. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tim. And what I'll do is I will... Um, I'll include a link in the show notes uh, to today's episode. Anyone can go and find those at artofprocurement.com slash podcast. Uh, I'll include a link to your LinkedIn profile, Tim. So if anyone wants to connect, um, that's probably the easiest way for them to do that. And I'll also uh, include a link to that very first show we did all those years ago for anyone who hasn't listened to it. I still recommend it. It's a really good, uh, good conversation around kind of the transformation journey and becoming a, a trusted advisor. So thanks for your time, Tim. Thank you. If this episode struck a chord with you, please do send it to somebody. We grow here at Art of Procurement through word of mouth, and that would be really appreciated. You can also support us by giving us a thumbs up, a star rating, or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Since 2015, we've built the world's largest free resource for procurement professionals looking to elevate their impact. Our resources span podcasts like this, videos, blog posts, papers, and events. To join us on the inside and to ensure you never miss an episode, a webinar, an event, or a post, please do subscribe to our weekly newsletter, This Week in Procurement. You can do that at artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. That's artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.